are, uh, we are uh, privileged to have uh, the majority leader sitting in this morning for Senator Peterson. And we will uh, call the meeting to order. First of all, request for bill introductions. I believe we have several. Senator Holscher has bill introduction first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, I have RS3464. This is in regard to IVF and providing that a fertilized human oven or embryo existing outside of a uterus shall not be considered an unborn child or human being. Okay, committee, any questions or objections to introduction to that bill? Seeing none, that bill's introduced. Any other bill introductions? I believe Mr. O'Donnell has one. There it is now. There you go. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have our long-awaited uh, uh, medical cannabis bill. It's RS number 2241. Oh, yeah, please identify yourself, Mike. Oh, sorry, Michael O'Donnell, Kansas Natural Remedies. Okay. Uh, committee, any questions or objections to introduction to that bill? Seeing none, that is introduced. Any other bill introductions? Seeing none, we will move on. Uh, next, we have approval of minutes. Uh, committee, we sent out minutes for March 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th. And I would entertain a motion uh, to approve those minutes as uh, submitted. As we have a mo motion from Senator Kluse. We have a second. Second from Senator faust -Gadeau. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The minutes are approved. Thank you, committee. Moving on, we have uh, two hearings this morning, and then if we have time, we'll try to do some final action. Uh, we'll just kind of see how the time uh, uh, progresses here today. First hearing is on House Bill 2358, and I'll have Jason give us the overview. Jason? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. House Bill 2358 uh, amends uh, two statutes under the Uniform Vital Statistics Act um, to expand the qualifications of individuals who can certify the cause of death of an individual. Uh, under current law, the funeral director overseeing the disposition of the body of a deceased individual is required to file a death certificate with the Office of Vital Statistics, and the funeral director must first obtain a certificate, certification of the cause of death of that individual from the physician who last attended the individual uh, before they passed away. Uh, the bill would amend 65-2412 to permit certification of cause of death to be completed uh, by a cause of death certifier, which is a definition that's added to the uh, definitional section of the act. Um, and this would be a licensed physician, a licensed physician assistant, a licensed advanced practice registered nurse, the district coroner, deputy coroner, or special deputy coroner, um, any of those individuals could complete that certification of cause of death that's necessary for completion of the death certificate. Um, Current law provides that if the death occurred without any medical provider in attendance or if an inquiry is needed um, because of the cause of death, then the coroner is responsible for investigating completing that certification. So there's that caveat if there is an inquiry. Um, in addition uh, to including that definition, the House Committee on Federal and State Affairs amended the bill to also include on page three of the bill a liability immunity provision. Um, so the uh, individual who certifies the cause of death um, does so in good faith is immune from any civil liability um, for completing such certification. Uh, the bill did pass the House on final action 106 to 9 and would go into effect on July 1st of this year if enacted. I'd be happy to stand for any questions. Committee, any questions? Senator Fausto. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jason, so say that part again of who can, so right now it can be a nurse, but you're saying it has to be the last attending physician? So currently it's the last physician who attended the deceased is the one who completes that cause of death certification. The bill would expand that to include a, a broader list of individuals. That includes a physician's assistant, an APRN, the coroner, deputy coroner, um, those individuals could um, complete that certification of cause of death. 
And they work under the supervision of a doctor, and like the APRNs? And a PA and an APRN work under supervision of a physician, but they would be the ones who could actually sign the certification. Any other question? Senator Reichman. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, without stating the obvious, uh, why is this being expanded? Uh, like, do you have any reasons why they want so many other people to be able to do this? I'll have to defer to the conferee. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> any other questions, committee? Seeing none, thank you, Jason. We have one oral proponent, and this is Pam Scott from the Kansas Association of Funeral Directors. And Pam, welcome to Fed and State. Thank you. Good morning. I am Pam Scott. I'm the executive director for the Kansas Funeral Directors Association. And we represent funeral directors, embalmers, and funeral homes across the state of Kansas. And we ask for the introduction of this bill uh, and, and support it. The purpose really is to expedite the timely filing of death certificates across the state by expanding who can certify death certificates. And basically all this does is add uh, physicians, assistants, and advanced practical nurses to those who can uh, complete the medical certification on death certificates. Uh, funeral directors often have difficulty getting death, the medical certification on death certificates completed. Um, I've heard from funeral directors, especially in the western parts of the state, that it can take weeks to get a death certificate um, certified. Um, the reasons include the physician may be just too busy to uh, complete it in a timely manner, and right now he can't give the authority to his uh, physician assistant or nurse practitioner to complete them. Um, in some cases, there may be uh, situations where it's hard to determine which physician is uh, responsible for completing the medical certification. There's traveling physicians that, that go around the state. They're hard to track down. Uh, in other cases, there may be some uh, disagreements between doctors about which one needs, needs to sign it. Someone could have went to an emergency room. Is it that or the physician that's treated them for, treated them for the illness through times? And in the western parts of the state, uh, the deceased may not have even seen a physician. Uh, and a lot of the clinics and hospitals are serviced by uh, nurse practitioners. And um, a physician may have given them consultation by Zoom. Uh, but uh, the nurse practitioner or physician's assistant may be the only one who gave them any direct care. Uh, out uh, in the remote parts of the state. So a physician may not feel comfortable in those instances uh, signing the uh, medical certification on the death certificate. And it's important that death certificates are filed in a timely manner. A funeral director cannot inter uh, or dispose of a body until a death certificate is filed. And this sometimes can result in delays in uh, the funeral service, barrier, burial or cremation of a body. So it's also important to the family to take care of uh, end of life estate matters, uh, whether it be uh, closing a bank account, uh, filing for life insurance benefits, and uh, filing for benefits, basically. Uh, you have to provide a death certificate to show maybe your spouse uh, passed away and to get social security benefits. So those are all important reasons. It's also important to get uh, the cause of death reported to the uh, National Center for Health Statistics. And uh, um, they need to be sure that there aren't any public health concerns out there, and, and they report them to the Center for Disease Control if there would be any. So we have run this bill by the Office of Vital Statistics. They have no concerns. We have uh, uh, worked with different uh, health care organizations, uh, medical society, the Physicians Assistance Association, and the nurses. And there's no opposition to this bill. Uh, there were 10, I don't know this in this committee, but on the House side, there were 10 conferees uh, that were in support of, of this bill. And um, we would appreciate your support of this. We think it's important uh, for families out there. Thank you, Pam. I think we'll have you stand for questions first. I'll just call attention that we do have two written-only proponents, Kathy Gordon and Doug Smith, and uh, want to go and no 
neutral, no opponents. Uh, committee, oh, any questions for Pam? Uh, Senator Reitman, then Senator Cluse. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for testifying. It was very helpful information that you gave. I, I guess um, with how long does it take to fill out one of these uh, certificates and how, how many pages and that type of thing? Well, the medical certification isn't long. I mean, the completing of a death certificate, the funeral director has a role and the physician has a role. It's all done electronically. And so uh, actual filling out of the uh, medical certification doesn't maybe determining the cause of death might take a little longer. And as, as, if, as was stated, uh, if it's an unattended death or there's any reason, a suspicious reason for the death, it is always uh, referred to the coroner to complete. Okay. And then when you, your example that you gave of the, the, the physician wasn't there, and, and of course I also live in the western part of the state, so there's pro probably one of the problems that they're having there. So uh, how do they do it now? Uh, how does he end up... Does he end up filling out now begrudgingly, or is that why it takes so long, or, or how does that? Thank you. Yeah, there, there could be many reasons. I mean, just tracking a person down, and then, you know, finally you have two, a lot of times you have two doctors, and, well, you should sign it, no, you should sign it, and one of them begrudgingly finally decides to sign it. The Office of Vital Statistics is very helpful too to put a little pressure on them out there. If we have, if a funeral director has a problem uh, getting a doctor to sign, they will sometimes try to help us track down uh, who is supposed to sign. Hospitals are helpful sometimes, but uh, you know, there's a, a zillion different reasons why someone might not sign, but just locating them and determining who the right one is difficult sometimes. Senator Clues. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your testimony. Um, is it uh, discretion of the funeral homes as far as putting out uh, an obituary? Do they have to wait on that death certificate, or is it the discretion of the funeral home? How, do, how does that work? I know that I've dealt with people in the past that have had issues concerning that. Well, I guess you don't really put an obituary in until you know when the service is going to be. Uh, so you can tell people, you know, okay, the funeral service and visitation are going to be a certain time. And if you don't have a death certificate signed, then you really can't put a, the information you need in obituary in the paper. So, uh, like I know with um, stillbirths, sometimes families want to get things going. So you're saying they pretty well have to wait on that signed certificate. Well, I mean, you could put a notice in if you're not having, you're, you're not doing the obituary to let people know when they can come to the funeral service. If there's not one, then there's no reason why you couldn't put an obituary. They're really not related, but, but usually they're not done until you know when all the plans are in place. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, committee? I've got a one. If you could speak to the uh, the immune, immunity from the civil liability, but not in the Senate version, but in the House version there that's in this, why was that necessary for somebody to sign it, uh, immunity from liability for signing a death certificate? Well, it, it's, it's, it wasn't really anything we initially brought forward, but to getting the parties to agree to uh, one of the reasons uh, was to put that provision in there. There's not, I don't know of any cases there's ever been uh, with uh, uh, completing a death certificate. You're not treating a live patient, but uh, I guess if someone had some reason they wanted to disagree with the finding, uh, I guess they're... It can always be amended up to one year after uh, after the death. Doctor, physician, whatever can go in and change it if someone uh, disagreed. After a year, you have to go to court to get the death certificate amended. For the cause of death. For the cause okay. of death. But that's really all they're doing is the cause, not treating right. the patient. Because I know in a situation when my brother died, they thought it was one thing. They did an autopsy. The report, report came out six months later found out it was something different. So then they can go back and amend the, uh, the vital statistics records and things. Yes, they can, they can go amend them uh, at any time. It may be a little different procedure how long it is. And, you know, 
those usually don't have anything to do with the funeral. They have some under underlying reason involved with that. But you know, it's funny we talk about delays too. Though by law, you're supposed to file a death certificate within three days. You know, now we're going weeks. Yeah. But I, I, you know, I think they just wanted some protection there because it's not an exact science. If, if a body's being cream, I mean, you can always inter the disinter the body. If uh, uh, it's a cremation. Before you cremate, you have to get a coroner to sign off on it. So the coroners look to see whether there's a, you know, a crime that occurred. Got it. Any other questions, committee? Seeing none, thank you, Pam. That closes the hearing on House Bill 2358. Next, we have a hearing on Senate Bill 535. And I will have Jason give us the bill brief. Hey, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Senate Bill 535 uh, amends one statute in the Kansas Expanded Lottery Act. Um, this statute, 74-8751, uh, deals with the Kansas Racing and Gaming Commission's regulatory authority over the casinos and racetracks and the vendors that supply those casinos and racetracks under the uh, Expanded Lottery Act. Uh, under current law, the KRGC is required to certify each vendor's compliance with standards for security, fitness, and background investigations. Um, and so they're directed to adopt rules and regulations uh, to make those certifications. Uh, that includes any electronic gaming machine manufacturers, technology providers, and computer system providers who propose a contract with a casino or a racetrack um, that has uh, slot machines in it. Um, the, a gaming facility manager or the state uh, to provide those goods or services that are related to the operation of those facilities. Um, and the KRGC has adopted rules and regs to implement these statutory requirements. What Senate Bill 535 does, as you can see on page two, is uh, create uh, a stat uh, an exemption from that statutory certification requirement so that it does not apply to certain uh, suppliers or manufacturers of equipment that is sold to a casino or racetrack. And so the new provision there would exempt manufacturers and suppliers who are manufacturing and supplying goods or services to a person who is required to be certified by the commission under the, the current law, um, but that does not propose to contract directly with the state or any casino or racetrack to provide those goods or services and does not perform any work or services on the premises of a casino or racetrack. So if those three conditions are met, then that manufacturer supplier would not be required to go through the background investigations and get a certification from the Racing and Gaming Commission um, as they are currently required under rules and regulations of the KRGC. Uh, if this is enacted, it would go into effect on July 1st. I'd be happy to stand for any questions. Thank you, Jason. Any questions, committee? Senator Alley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Jason. Um, does this have anything to do with, with food? Did, like a vendor of uh, like a restaurant inside the casino? I don't know that food service is contemplated under these kinds of certifications. I would defer potentially to the commission to clarify that. Um, the statute is really more targeting the technology and machinery manufacturers of, of the operation of the gaming um, itself by the casino or the racetrack. Senator Fasquito, then Senator Holscher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, Jason, uh, in the bill itself on line 12, so the persons uh, direct, directly or indirectly uh, owning 5%. So that 5%, it, so when you go down to a person's reputation on line 17, how does that coincide? Are those... Is that the same persons? Yes, the 5% is to capture uh, individuals who have, uh, by statutory definition, a significant ownership interest in the vendor. Um, and so if they have a 5% or more interest, then they are a person of significance and would have to get uh, submit um, to um, 
the background investigation. Senator Holscher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jason. Um, can you tell me how long these rules and regulations have been in effect that are outlined? I believe they were adopted soon after the Expanded Lottery Act was uh, enacted back in 2007. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other questions, committee? Seeing none, thank you, Jason. <clears throat> we have two oral proponents on this. First up, we have Josh Nye from Kriegenhauser Nye Law Group. Josh, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Chairman Thompson, members of the committee. My name is Josh and I'm an attorney who practices uh, constitutional and administrative law in Kansas and I assist local businesses in navigating ever-changing enforcement and regulatory interpretations of Kansas administrative agencies. Uh, 535, Senate Bill 535 is a bill that addresses administrative overreach. Um, I represent Heidemann Company, Inc., who is a financial services and products um, company in Kansas City, Kansas, uh, owned by Josh Heidemann, uh, who's behind me and will be testifying. They've been providing financial services um, since 1948 in Kansas, but in Kansas casinos expanded their operations that were previously targeted at um, banks and grocery uh, stores, basically currency counters and cash recyclers, which we can explain more in a, in a second. Um, into Kansas casinos. Um, since 2009, uh, Heidemann has provided products and services to Kansas casinos, and since at least 2012, they provided money counters and uh, cash recyclers um, in Kansas casinos and have operated under the same regulations and statutes that have been on the books since then. Nothing has changed in, in Kansas law. What has changed is that as of October of last um, year, 2023, Heidemann was told uh, indirectly, actually through its c casino clients, that they were no longer going to be able to install these cash uh, recyclers and money counters in um, Kansas casinos um, because uh, they um, were the manufacturers of those products were not uh, separately certified, um, and so. The Heidemann at that point had already purchased several products uh, in, consistent with its um, business operations for the past 12 years. A uh, $60,000 machine that it was told it cannot install in the Kansas casino started getting feedback from its clients, three of the four casinos in Kansas, that no longer could these be installed unless they sought um, separate certification for the manufacturers of those products, one of whom is in Germany, um, in order to continue operations. Heidemann is separately certified. They've been certified as a provider, a contractor with the state since uh, 2009. Um, there have been no issues and there have been no changes to law. There's only been a change in the fall of 2023 in an agency interpretation. So what do these cash counters, cash recyclers and money counters do? This is basically, I know we can't use props on Senate and uh, House floor anymore, but maybe sound effects. These are the machines that you see in banks. Uh, they're glorified hand counters. Um, I was a teller as early as 16 and uh, worked in banks and they made my life easier, didn't have to count it out. If a, if a damaged bill got spit out, take it out, count the stack and make sure you, the machine was right. Um, the agency interpretation as of um, October 2023 is that these manufacturers now have to be um, separately certified under an interpretation of KAR 112-102-02, and I'll spare you the uh, legal references uh, today, um, but really our contention is that this bill should not be necessary. We've sought some sort of middle ground with the agency since um, October of 2023, correspondence and phone calls in December, and then finally a letter in February of this year saying, please, please, is there a middle ground here? that would not uh, require us to reach out to uh, GND and Glory, the manufacturers of these products that who never stepped foot in a Kansas casino, do not contract directly with the state at all. That regulatory hook is in Heidemann, a Kansas-based business that has ensured the, the integrity of these machines since 2012 in Kansas ca casinos. We're here today because there has been no offer of middle ground to somehow move forward on this. And so, the, um, the attempt to regulate the machines uh, really um, comes out of a agency interpretation that we just learned about uh, within the last couple of weeks, which is 
that the agency believes under KSA 74-8772 that the legislature has authorized the Kansas Racing and Gaming Commission to make regulations it deems necessary to carry out our mission to protect the integrity of gaming in Kansas. That's it, that's the basis. Can you imagine giving me as the former securities commissioner a statute that allows me to create any regulation I want to require financial services advisors to make sure that their Microsoft computers or their Dell computers are separately licensed with my agency to make sure that those computers are working properly. Instead of regulating the person that's actually doing the installation, the, the services that are being provided, the products, they're trying to go back in the supply chain to start regulating that. The problem with this is that Heidemann uh, believes that it has been targeted. For one reason or another, we don't know why, but we're only talking about machines. We're not talking about Microsoft. We're not talking about Adobe. We're not talking about Dell all of which these computers interact with the gaming system. But the providers of those are what I believe the more specific statute, and I've laid this out for um, the agency that in a letter that's attached to my testimony, that the more specific statute, um, KSA 748751, only allows uh, the Racing Gaming Commission to regulate those persons who would propose to contract directly with the state. Their follow-up regulation under KAR 112-102-01, not 02 like I said earlier, which defines manufacturers, 01 says these persons are those who provide goods or services to a gaming facility in Kansas. That's Heidemann. That's its competitor, Cummins. What it doesn't allow is them to then bootleg into 112102-02 to say, oh, well, we see manufacturers exist in, in our regs. We, we can require certification. Our contingent, our, um, what we contend is that um, this law simply does not allow for that. We didn't think statutory led, um, clarification would be necessary, but here we are. Um, and so ultimately, we're asking you to clarify what we think the law already says. I think it's telling that the Racing Gaming Commission's um, testimony that provided to you today in um, opposition, not in neutral, but in opposition to this, this clarification, doesn't mention a single statute, doesn't mean, mention a single regulation. To date, they have not engaged with our primary contention, which is the statute the enabling statute simply does not allow you to regulate this. What is more, if this interpretation goes forward, it's not just Heidemann they have to regulate. They do have, it is the dog that caught, caught the car. They have to regulate Microsoft. They have to re regulate Budweiser. They have to regulate um, all types of up the supply uh, chain manufacturers to start asking their CEOs to engage in extensive background checks, which would ask for the, the background uh, criminal uh, history of their relatives of these. And that's simply never gonna happen with multinational companies. Kansas businesses want to be able to provide services and goods. They want to be able to play on a fair regulatory playing field, and they want those um, regulations to be applied across the board. And so we're asking for a simple clarification in statute that the companies that need to be regulated in Kansas are those who directly contract with the state and are, have boots on the ground in um, Kansas casinos. Notably, and this is the last thing I'll say, um, the chief competitor in this market space of Heidemann is a one-stop shop manufacturer, installer, uh, selling, they, they sell, sell their products and they serve their, their products. That company should be regulated as a manufacturer because they manufacture products that they directly contract and sell and service in Kansas casinos. Heidemann sells products that are multinational companies, Glory and G&D, that, um, and has done so since 2012, that are, they are on the hook for. And there have been, uh, uh, when there are compliance issues, if there have been compliance issues, their license is on the line. What we're asking for is a level playing field um, that would actually call a spade a spade 
and whatever regulation applies to Heidemann would ultimately have to be applied across the board. This is a far more efficient way of fixing the problem. We don't want to have to go to litigation on this. We believe that's what the legislative intent in 2007 was. We believe that's what the legislative intent is of the current law, and we're just asking for clarification. Thank you. Josh, we'll hold for questions committee until our other oral opponent or proponent uh, testifies. Uh, Josh Heidemann from Heidemann Company. Josh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, good morning. My name is Josh Heidemann. I'm a lifelong Kansan and third generation owner of the Heidemann Company. My grandfather, Edward Heidemann, started the company in 1948 working out of his garage in Mission, Kansas. Ed owned and operated the company until his death in 1989. My father, Douglas Heidemann, took ownership of the company upon Ed's death. Ed worked at the Heidemann Company, or Doug worked at Heidemann Company for nearly 40 years and served as a proud member of the Air National Guard out of Forbes Field for 20 of those years. Uh, I started working at the Heidemann Company in 2007 and purchased the company last year from my father. My wife, Heidi, and I live in Shawnee, Kansas. The Heidemann Company has 28 employees and sells and services financial equipment such as currency counters, sorters, ATMs, and cash recyclers. We are a distributor for multinational manufacturers, and we sell these products across a variety of industries, including banks, grocery stores, and casinos. We have been certified, we have been a certified vendor with the Kansas Racing and Gaming Commission since 2009, and have sold to casinos in Kansas for more than 12 years. But shortly after purchasing the company from my father last fall, KRGC informed me that we would no longer be authorized to sell some of our products to Kansas casinos. This news was surprising to me because we have not changed, the equipment has not changed and we have not changed. We are selling the same type of equipment made by the same manufacturers. This news was also financially significant because we have invested significant time, energy and resources to promote, sell and service these products to Kansas casinos. I contacted KRGC after receiving this news and was asked for an explanation about this abrupt change. The statute had not changed. Our equipment had not changed. KRGC told me that our machines are, quote, gaming devices and had, quote, slipped through the cracks. KRGC told me the situation could be corrected if my uh, manufacturers applied for and received certified vendor status. I do not think this is a correct application of the statute to our equipment. For one thing, our manufacturers do not contract with casinos. The Heidemann Company does. Secondly, our equipment has no bearing or impact on gaming revenue at the casinos. You can run the same $100 bill through the machine four different times. It does not mean your revenue triple or quadrupled as a result. The Heidemann Company enters contracts with the casinos for the sale and servicing of equipment. If our equipment constitutes a gaming device, our manufacturers are therefore, and our manufacturers are therefore considered to have a contract with the casino, it would seem that the same reasoning should apply to all equipment, electronic equipment in the casino, including software operating systems such as Microsoft, printers, computers such as Dell and HP, and the manufacturer of those devices would likewise need to supply, uh, apply for certification. This this would unduly burden the uh, Kansas, many Kansas businesses that distribute products to Kansas casinos. I've tried to work with KRGC to explain this issue and find a solution. To date, we have not been able to reach a resolution and KRGC's position remains that my multi multinational vendors must apply for certified vendor status. This might sound easy, it is not. I'm, I'm not sure whether any of my manufacturers would be willing to go through the arduous process of submitting tax returns, criminal records, even if expunged or sealed by a court, and criminal records of extended family members. And if they did and were approved, they would most likely circumvent our company and try to sell directly to the casinos to justify their undertaking. Either outcome significantly hurts my Kansas business and will likely result in the Heidemann Company losing local employees and will hinder small businesses like mine. I'm asking for your help KRGC is inflexible, despite what I think are flaws in its logic. Litigation is expensive and slow, and my company needs a quicker resolution to avoid this damage. Therefore, I'm seeking your help to make minor changes to a statute to clarify what I think the intent of the law has always been. 
KRGC certify only those vendors who propose to contract with the Kansas casinos. KRGC's current position creates an unlevel playing field in favor of large national and multinational companies at the expense of local businesses. This statutory change would instead favor Kansas businesses. Please support this bill to clarify this position. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Josh. Committee, there are no uh, written proponents, no neutral proponents, so I'm going to open up to questions for our oral proponents. Senator Blasey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question is probably for Josh. Um, what's, or either one, but what's, what's, uh, what's changed? I mean, so it, my understanding is this statute 06, 07, I think you cited. What's changed? What's, why is this the case today? We've tried to find a, an explanation for that, I think. Uh, Josh Heideman mentioned that one explanation was that it slipped through the cracks. Another uh, explanation that I think is in the letter of Executive Director Brownlee that I attached to my testimony um, is also that they've they've been told in the past, um, even um, uh, Josh Heideman's father had been told as uh, early as 2013 that they may want to get their uh, manufacturers certified. At that time, that was re resolved. Um, because it was determined uh, under that administration that these manufacturers don't set foot in the casino. And that, that makes sense to me. Now, that's not in the statute. Setting foot in the, in the casino is, is, uh, is, implicates the idea of providing direct services to the state. And so I think that that's the connection there. Nothing has changed in the law. Um, ultimately, the question comes down to the definition of a gaming supplier in that 102-02. Problem with that is that modifies 112-102-1, which is the basic regulatory prohibition, derivative of statute that says no person identified in 102-2 in as a gaming supplier may provide any equipment or services to a gaming facility. And that's, that's always been the case. You cannot provide goods or services under contract with the state unless you're certified. That's why Heidemann's certified. This new interpretation now says, oh, even if you don't provide under 102-1 or this enabling statute, we're still going to make you register under manufacture um, under 102-02. 102-02, again, just modifies the basic pro prohibition. So you have to have the contract, you have to the, have the providing of services or goods first, then you can get into who, who is a manufacturer. Mr. Chairman. My follow -up. Well, the second question is, if for some reason we're miraculously able to resolve this just through a conversation with the agency, do you see the need for this legislation to continue to progress if you're able to work it out? I think that the, there's been enough questions in, in Heidemann's uh, history that, you know, litigation is expensive. It's how I put food on the table, unfortunately. Um, but at the end of the day, this is the most, I mean, when the legislature needs to clarify, I think the legislature should clarify and we at least have a current administration that thinks it can regulate under this broad blank slate separate statute that says any regulation to ensure the integrity of the gaming, um, gaming uh, uh, facilities in Kansas. I, I, at some point, you just got to rein them in. But I, I would love for a conversation to fix it. Senator Straub. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think my question is for uh, Josh Nye. Um, did the statute actually change, or was it just the interpretation of it? I missed part of your testimony. Yep, just the interpretation. Thank you. To my knowledge, these regulations were put in place at the time of the Expanded Gaming Act. I, I just a quick Westlaw search. Um, Amended in the 102-2 was amended in um, 2016. I don't know what was amended. 102-1 um, was effective 2009 and has not changed since. Senator Fascudo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My question is for you as well. So is it nigh or nay? It's nigh. Thank you. Um, so, um, so. No. <laughs> thank, thank you. Just my, dad, my dad says it's nice, so I just went with it. So. Thank you. So um, the machine 
that you're speaking of, for an example, the blur sound you made, right. uh, is that the machine where if I want to get change for a, a $50 bill, I insert it and then it gives me change, or can you clarify? Yeah, Josh Heideman would be much more um, adept at explaining that. Uh, we have two machines. One is the money counter, and the other is the cash recycler. I'll have him explain. Josh, if you could step up and explain the difference between the two. Yeah, so I believe what you're explaining is a, a kiosk, a bill redemption kiosk, where you put the, the bill in, and it will redeem or, or break your bill down into different. This is not what we're talking about. We're talking about equipment that goes in the back of house of the casino and just counts the money. As it's yeah. Senator Clues. I'm sorry, the cash recycler then would be basically a, a, a glorified cash drawer when the staff needs 50 bucks, they type in 50 bucks, pops out yeah. 50 bucks, and they can put that back in, pops it back. So it's yeah, right. yeah. not customer, not customer facing. Senator Clues. Oh, okay, we got two Josh, uh, Josh Hyden. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So help me here a second, uh, layman's terms. So. There hasn't, if I'm understanding this correctly, there really hasn't been a problem, but you see the overreach by the miss, what you consider misinterpretation of the regulation, trying to find what the legislative intent was and currently is. So not a problem to become a problem, and it could cost a lot of money yeah, it's, and, and yeah, it's so a lot of money. Yeah, it's costing us a lot of money. We have, you know, sixty, seventy thousand dollars worth of equipment sitting idle in our warehouse. We haven't been able to install for our customers since October when they wanted it installed. But I'm, am I seeing this correctly? Then it really hasn't been a problem. It has not been a problem for the past twelve plus years. Okay, thank you. Committee, any other questions? Let me just clarify this. I think Josh Nye. As I understand this, this would be like a Chevy dealer contracting with the. Uh, <laughs> I do I use that on purpose. Uh, <laughs> Chevy dealer contracting with the casino and then having to certify every parts manufacturer if he supplied a truck. That's how we see it, or hauling in Bill Gates for every computer that's installed to help with the processing of gaming revenues. At some point, it's a reduction ad absurdum. Okay. And I think at this point, the, the, public sorry, the public policy arguments that are in the written testimony of the agency may be valid points. And maybe you want to regulate the supply chain all the way down to the little screw that goes into some of these um, machines. But at some point, you have to ask yourself, what are we regulating? Why? And specifically, when it, I mean, the slot machines are installed by the, the companies that, that uh, manufacture or service those. Um, I would like to know from the agency, where does this regulation stop? Because it feels like it's just Heidemann. And the effect of that will be to create a monopoly for its competitor in all four casinos. Okay. And finally, uh, Senator Clues. Josh, if you wouldn't mind, and I think you may already just kind of answered my question of um, where does it stop? I mean, how much can an agency zero in on in just bringing this up? Where does it stop? The, the way it stops in the law is the rule of law. Give us clear, bright line regulations that apply across the board and if we're required to, to register in, for a certain public policy reason, and manufacturers are, say it in the, in the statute. But I don't think that the administrative uh, regulator, any more than when I was a regulator, can beyond, go beyond the statute. Um, and uh, we are open to amendments that would narrow this in. If there, are, if there are unattended consequences of this, that are somehow going to make it the Wild West for slot machines in Kansas, we're not after that. We think this is a low impact area of casino operations, that it's regulating the sound again, and we're asking for, um, we're asking for some middle ground, and if there is middle ground to be found in conversations, we would be open to that. So just follow up, just close. So technically then, it's, um, 
how they want to define it, how they want to interpret it versus what our legislative intent was originally. To date, we have not received an answer to our contention that the statute only allows you to regulate those who propose to contract with the state. The regulation that their regulation they're citing is derivative, or that their regulation is derivative of, says you must have a certification if you're going to provide goods or services to the state. That's Heidemann. So I, to date, I don't have an explanation. Thank you. Okay, committee. Um, I think we've exhausted that line of questioning. Thank you very much. Well, let's move on to our opponents, James Bain from the Kansas Racing and Gaming Commission. James. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Senator Faust-Gadeau and the rest of the committee. My name is James Bain. I'm an attorney at the Kansas Racing Gaming Commission. We appreciate the opportunity to present our opposition testimony to Senate Bill 535. In our view, SB 535 inadvertently uh, creates a loophole in the licensing and ongoing monitoring process of gaming supplies and certain financial products, uh, which would allow these manufacturers to totally avoid KRGC licensing and ongoing regulatory monitoring. I first want to start by um, talking about the couple different licenses we have for supplies that are provided um, to the gaming facilities. We have um, a non-gaming supplier license and a gaming supplier, and this is where we get into food and beverage and hotel operations. Items that are not essential to gaming operations or financial operations of the gaming facility are in this non-gaming supplier category. Um, and they are um, a much lower investigation and background and certification. And that makes sense because the um, gaming supplies, because of their nature, um, require a more stringent um, investigatory um, process. Um, and so when you hear the, the gaming supply side, it is your slot machines, your dice, ATMs, and other financial technology that is connected to either the lottery, central computer, or the central accounting of the gaming facility um, itself. And so it's these products that are essential to gaming or essential to um, the finances of the, of the facility. And in our view, these types of equipment require um, more intense licensing and, of course, that ongoing monitoring that comes with being a licensee. And I can get into um, this question of, you know, where does it stop? And so let's, we can take an ATM machine as an example. An ATM, a lot of components go into an ATM, but those components are not an ATM until they are put together. And so our licensee, the manufacturer of the ATM um, is the one is is the one that is putting these the pieces together that they're worthless until they are manufactured and so that's the difference um, and so we do license these manufacturers that put the pieces together um, to create the gaming product um, and so that's kind of the where where it stops in in our view. Um, so the current process of becoming a licensed gaming manufacturer includes background checks of key employees, key stockholders, and a certification that the product um, performs accurately and fairly the way it is, is supposed to, um, to create uh, confidence in gaming in Kansas amongst the public. Um, SB 535 would allow manufacturers of gaming supplies to evade these licensing requirements and ongoing monitoring simply by hiring a third-party vendor to sell the product to the gaming facility. The ability for gaming manufacturers to have this choice to be unlicensed under SB 535, that's what creates the unlevel playing field. You could have um, licensed manufacturers on one side who have to go through the licensing process, who have to, um, who would be subject to ongoing regulation by KRGC. That's on the licensed manufacturer side. You could also have unlicensed manufacturers who use SB 35 to hire a vendor. Those manufacturers would not face um, licensing, um, background checks. They would not face ongoing monitoring for, um, for compliance with um, KRGC regulations. And so SB 35 does create um, an unequal playing field for those two now they would have options to either hire a vendor and not face regulation 
or um, sell it themselves, but they would be subject uh, to regulation. Um, and so our position is that gaming in Kansas, in the United States, is highly regulated for a reason. The amount of money at stake is an opportunity for con artists and criminals um, to take advantage of the lack of government oversight. Um, we believe we need to be, continue to be rigorous in our licensing and ongoing regulatory monitoring. The, regu the monitoring doesn't stop when a license is granted. It continues for the life of, uh, of the product and the life of, their, um, of, that, of that license. Um, allowing unlicensed manufacturers of gaming equipment and financial technology to operate in Kansas um, invites uh, manufacturers that may not have the public's best interest in mind. And that's kind of where KRGC um, steps in, the ongoing licensing or ongoing monitoring and licensing um, does instill public confidence with gaming and that it is operated with integrity in Kansas. SB 535 effectively cuts out a large part of KRGC's responsibility to the public. And we ask that you not pass 535 out of committee. I can certainly get into specifics of, of this case if you like or, or other cases, um, but I'm here for questions and um, brought some colleagues with as well. Okay, we have no other oral opponents and uh, so committee will open to questions. Senator Blasey first, then Senator uh, Longmine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have the same questions um, for Mr. Bain. I guess I better go with last name because I'm glad you're not a Josh or a James. A lot of Josh's in here. Uh, so my question is, what, again, what's changed from your interpretation that you've done, for, my understanding, for the course of, of years, and it changed somehow last fall of your interpretation of the law or administrative regulation? So what's changed? And so we would say nothing has changed. We have d documents going back to 2013 where Heidemann was notified that these products needed to be licensed. And so our position since then, so this whole time has been, if the financial product is connected to the lottery central computer or connected to the accounting um, computer, you know, the accounting central computer of the facility, it needs to be licensed. If it is not connected to any of those um, central operations, it does not have to be licensed. And so Heidemann has several products in gaming facilities that are not connected to these central computers, and they don't need to be um, they're licensed as a non-gaming um, product, which the, on, so on the non-gaming side, the manufacturer does not have to be licensed. The vendor does. So then for 10 years, they've been operating without any follow-up from you guys. I mean, you're saying they are illegally, or they need to be registered as vendors, but you're saying for the last 10 years, you kind of ignored it. I'm, conf I'm confused by the long track here. Well, I, the, there were, there potentially was a mistake made in 2015 that allowed them to operate without, like, that allowed, they always operated with license, that allowed these products from Glory and G&D to be installed without a license. There was, there was potentially that mistake made, I believe in 2015. We have documentation going back to 2013 informing them that these products needed to be licensed. So what happened in 15? The agency gave them approval to not have to? There was. I, I wasn't there. There was apparently someone along the line accepted. So it, when, a, when a product is delivered to a gaming facility, that, the product has to be accepted and um, you know, certified for what it is. At a gaming facility, back in 2015, a shipment was accepted with one of these products that is currently connected to I don't believe it's connected to a lottery central computer, but it's connected to the computer's system of the facility. I think that's part of my concern is regulatory bodies. We've seen this with a lot of regulatory bodies. Sometimes interpretation changes based on personnel. So I don't know how much personnel change has happened at the agency since 2013 or 15, but it seems like maybe there's been some changes. And so I'm just, I'm curious to, do, I mean, if, do you think we can resolve this issue without legislation? You, have, you said you have big concerns about this carving out, major carve outs of the current law. Do you think we can work this out, or is the legislature going to have to intervene? I guess I'm not as familiar with the specifics of other products that would be um, brought in, or what um, what this would open the door for. Um, so I'm not I'm not as versed on all the different 
types of financial equipment that are used in the, in the gaming facilities. Senator Longbottom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Bain, thank you for your testimony. A couple of examples that were used, um, and based on your analogies that you just gave, why aren't you uh, licensing Microsoft or Dell? I mean, I guess Microsoft and Dell, it is not a gaming product until you, it's not a gaming, it's not a gaming product until it is um, changed with various technology or technologies installed on it. It is not a gaming product until that, um, until that accounting or you know, financial technology is installed. So are Microsoft and or Dell products used in gaming equipment? They might be on a, on a slot machine. It's, it's po probably on a slot machine. Are there, but again, that... Are they regulated and licensed? They are not. But that slot machine, it goes, it goes back to that Microsoft or Intel product is not gaming until the slot machine manufacturer installs their, you know, their proprietary software onto it. And at that point, it becomes for use in a gaming situation. Okay. Um, explain to me why a cash counter in the back office is considered gaming equipment. Our interpretation has been that it's gaming equipment because it could be, well, they are, either if the financial equipment is connected to the central lottery computer or connected to the accounting central computer system of the gaming facility. Do you think that hand counting would be better? I, it's probably more accurate. Or, or, no, 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 the, the machine is probably more efficient, probably more accurate. Steal from, harder to hide crime? You just don't know until that piece of equipment is certified. You could think of a lot of examples of how a product could be, um, could be changed to, for, for nefarious purposes. Think about it. In my final question, how long have you been with the agency? I started in April of last year. You haven't seen a gaming bill on the floor yet? Uh, uh, no, 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 yeah, not, not a gaming specific bill. We've testified on a couple other things this session, but. Some really bad things that can happen. Yeah. Bills come to the floor, so uh, just a suggestion from one center, I'd figure out how to work this out. Senator Holscher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, my question is this. So we have one supplier um, that is a proponent for the bill. And then my, my question is, I'm guessing other suppliers are being required to adhere to the regulations. Yeah, that, that's correct. Okay, very good. Thank you. Senator Straub. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Mr. Bain. How many other um, licensed vendors do you have that provide these same type of cash counters and recyclers? One, one other. Only one other? Yes. And do you know where they're based out of? It, it, they, they're manufactured in Illinois, but they're, they are licensed and you know, certified that they, they do the manufacturing and the selling to the, the facilities. Um, I'm, I'm not so familiar with the gaming industry, contrary to what Americans for Prosperity has painted me as a gambler. I really don't know a lot about this. Um, so I'm gonna relate this to the um, election equipment. So if you had an electronic voting machine where you would push buttons on a machine, but then you have a separate machine from a separate vendor that tabulates paper ballots, could we kind of liken this to the same type of equipment? One is directly tied to the, the system and the other is supposedly maybe not connected to the system um, and is simply a tabulator. Does that make sense? Um, I, I guess I don't, I, no, I don't follow. Well, I, 
I'm, I'm guessing that the Racing and Gaming Commission has to certify actual um, slot machines, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Yeah, okay. And then these cash tabulators or these cash counters and recyclers are kind of like the paper ballot tabulator. They're just a counting machine. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that a fair assumption? I mean, yeah, I think so. I mean, I guess our interpretation is that if that tabulator is connected to the central computer of the lottery or connected to the central computer of the facility that it needs to be, that the manufacturer must be licensed in addition to the vendor, just like we treat um, gaming supplies. And I should, um, maybe this is a good point to, to point this out. Um, there was some talk about the definition of provider earlier. We don't see, we don't see provider as only the direct provider. We see pr provider as being indirect and direct. Um, so the, the regulation does not specify direct. Senator Alley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The question I have is, um, first of all, there's the casinos in Kansas, and you represent all of them, is that correct? Well, I represent the Kansas Racing Gaming Commission, right. which... The which machines that we're talking about today, are they used in all of our casinos? I think, I think they are. Uh, or three or three out of four. Yeah, there's certain... Okay. And they're a cash counter, is that correct? Uh, maybe some of the equipment they sell, I'm not sure. But you're, what we're debating here is, is it a cash counter? Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, they're cash counting, sorting. Okay, and are those cash counters used in other other industries? I believe so, yes. And would they be a similar concern with other industries? I'm not sure how other industries nope. treat their products. Would, do you think that there should be other a concern with cash counters in other industries? For instance, a bank. Do you think banks have, they count cash also daily? Yeah. And should that not be concern? Also, if these machines are not registered or... And they may be licensed in those other interest industries. I'm not sure how those, how those other, other industries go about regulation or um, licensing. And the last question, uh, obviously the cash counters cannot be accessed by the public. You, you wouldn't think so. I mean, we're trying... The industry, uh, the cash counters cannot be accessed by... They can't... Can, public doesn't have access to them, front front ass. Oh, no, they would be behind the cage or behind some secure, yeah. Okay, committee, uh, thank you, James. I think we're done uh, on Senate thank Bill you. 535. We'll call, uh, close the hearing on this bill. Uh, committee, uh, I had intended to do a little bit of bill working. We're out of time. Uh, just for a heads up for tomorrow, uh, I want to try, we will have one bill hearing. I'd like to try to kick out uh, the Joe Massey uh, nomination. Also take a look at uh, House Bill 2783, which is the autos and fuel. Um, see if we can't get the um, conceal and carry cleanup, which is uh, Senate Bill 523. We'll just see what kind of time we have tomorrow.